Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and um, welcome to this event, Next Generation Nigeria, How to Foster Inclusion, Social Justice and Opportunity for All. It's the fifth in a series of six events that Chatham House is hosting in its Next Generation Nigeria series. Um, also welcome to those who are on live stream. I expect our speaker is well known to most of you. Dr. Obi Eze Kwasili is at the moment the most prominent woman standing for the Nigerian presidency in 2019 for the Allied Congress Party of Nigeria. She's a former vice president of the World Bank's Africa region a very important founding director of Transparency International and was nominated for the 2018 Nobel Peace Prize for this work. She was Nigeria's Minister of Education from 2006 to 2007 and co-founder of the Bring Back Our Girls campaign to secure the return of the Chibok girls, the 300 Nigerian schoolgirls abducted by Boko Haram in 2014. And we're delighted to have her speak today. Just a few things, if I may remind you, can you please all ensure that your mobile phones are on silent? This meeting is on the record, which means you may use information from the meeting and may identify the speaker and any other participant. And uh, just a quick reminder that filming and recording of the event are not allowed, but you're very welcome to tweet using the hashtag CHAfrica. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to Dr. Ezekwesili. Thank you. Well, thank you so very much, uh, Professor Caroline, um, the Dame Hamilton, uh, for agreeing to chair this um, session here at um, Chatham House. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank Chatham House for having me uh, deliver this speech on this day. Over the years, Chatham House has been one of my favorite places to discuss policy and development in Africa, and I'm delighted to be amongst friends as I look around the crowd. That said, as many of you have probably figured, everyone is my friend now that I am a politician. <laughs> <laughs> many of you know me because of my work in government and policy over the years. And those of you that know me well, know that I do not like politics. However, over the last three decades, in and out of government, I have stayed in the face of the political class in my country, challenging them to provide the kind of leadership that all Africans require in order to fulfill their potentials. I have never crossed the red line from policy and advocacy into politics until now. I'm sure many of you must be wondering what happened to Obi. Why did you join the murky waters of Nigerian politics? Now, those who know me also know that I hate to talk about myself. But what kind of a politician would I be if I didn't start talking about myself? <laughs> Today, I would like to tell you about my journey from policy and advocacy around good governance into the shark-infested waters of Nigerian politics and why I now believe that the emergence of, an, of new political actors like myself who possess the competence, the character, and the capacity, as well as the courage to represent Africa's best opportunity at fostering inclusive governance, social justice, and opportunity for the next generation is what we should focus on. Since I was a child, I've always had a keen interest in policy and good governance. As a child, my father and I 
would watch the news together and debate the politics and policy of that season. In my many works and in, my, in, 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 in many ways in the course of my work, my life's work in public policy became shaped by those early childhood interactions with my father. It was also at this time that I began to develop a sense of leadership as justice. You see, when I was in secondary school, the military government at some point got this very weird idea that our generation of children had become too unruly. And so they sent military personnel across the country to instill discipline in us. At my own school, they sent us a certain Captain Obembe. Captain Obembe's way of life was to indiscriminately strike every student that just walked around him with a cane. Whether an offense was committed or not, you got the cane for simply walking past Captain Obembe. Naturally, this made Captain Obembe to be feared, even if not at all respected by all of us students of our school. But one day, he struck one of my really favorite friends and classmates who did nothing. And I decided I was going to face him down in public. I walked up and I called out Captain Obembe. The, the whole place went deadly quiet as he turned to look at me and all the eyes in the room followed him. You need to stop flogging students who do nothing wrong to you. You're confusing us by flogging people, whether they did something wrong or not, I said to him. <coughs> he bellowed, fresh whip still in his hand and said, are you talking to me? I said, yes, Captain Obembe. <laughs> I am talking to you. If students do no wrong, and you whip them, should you then discipline them when they do wrong? Nobody has an incentive to do the right thing. <sighs> You know, when I said this to him, the rest of the school and my schoolmates were looking at me making my strong case against the confusion that was Captain Obembe's choice of discipline. Even the school principal, who never stood up to Captain Obembe, was at this time saying, Katrin, Katrin. And I st stood there looking at Captain Obembe. Mm -hmm. Captain Obembe, interestingly, did nothing with that cane on that day. And that was the last time that Captain Obembe would flog anyone indiscriminately in the school. At my core, I cannot tolerate injustice, especially when it's done to the weak and vulnerable. I never liked it when bullies in my school picked on my weaker friends. Every time you can count on me to speak up, to stand up for those who cannot do so for themselves. But even though this has meant that my keen interest in governance is understood from the premise of my policy work. It did actually take a spiritual exercise <coughs> to launch me full time into my calling in governance. In the 90s, I began to attend a church that is known as the Redeemed Christian Church of God and belonged to the parish 
that was known as their papa family of the church. It was pastored by a revolutionary pastor, <coughs> Pastor Tony Rappel, who had trained as a medical doctor and then experienced something and gone full time into ministry. Under his spiritual leadership, many of us young professionals went through a training program and my own class of people that he trained who were prophetically called government workers. It, was, it didn't mean anything to me at that time. It took many decades for it to mean something. He called us government workers. Our mandate was to establish governmental order and good governance in society. Interestingly, many of the young people in that class included the current vice president of Nigeria, Vice President Professor Yemi Oshibajo, and many others who have at different times occupied responsible positions in Nigerian politics and governance, including the current chairperson of the tax authority in Nigeria, Mr. Tunde Fowler, and so many other names. Many of you who, like me, are people of faith will understand when I say that there was a divine ordination to focus on the issues of good governance. It was also around this time that in my capacity as an active citizen, I'd begun to publish a series of public pieces and editorials of poets on the need for good governance and transparency in my country under military rule. Eventually, I co-founded and served as a member of the Pioneer Board of Directors of Transparency International, where we pushed many of the key global resolutions and treaties against corruption. I remember our work that led to the United Nations moving forward the agenda for the UN Convention Against Corruption. And I remember our work with the OECD that led to the OECD Convention at law in bribery in international business. One of my greatest frustration, frustrations at, that, at the early beginnings of Transparency International was to know that countries in Europe allowed tax deductibility for corruption and bribery money paid by their companies in countries in Africa. We also developed the Corruption Perception Index, a quantitative tool for guiding actions and measures to <coughs> tackle corruption at national and international levels. The year 1993 marked a watershed moment in, for me in this long walk to good governance. After the 1993 elections, still judged as Nigeria's freest and fairest election, was annulled by the military regime of General Ibrahim Babangida. A few other young professionals and I began the concerned professionals and participated in it as a pressure group of professionals who fought against military dictatorship demanding the restoration of Chief MKO Abiola's mandate and championed locally and internationally the return to democracy in 1999. I will never forget the fateful day in 1996 when I received a cryptic call from the then Canadian High Commissioner Jerry Olson while I was preparing for one of the solidarity appearances of concerned professionals, which I, be, I started leading at that time as the first woman um, in charge 
of a team of leaders for the organization. And Jerry Olson knew that we were on our way to join Mrs. Kudira Tabiola at the High Court where the case concerning her husband was being heard. And I heard his voice on the phone saying, Obi, where are you? I am headed to court to be part of the case today. And he said, she's been shot. Maybe you might want to go back home. At that point, you know, it was hard to take it in. <laughs> it was a first in Nigeria. It was a first. Being a citizen officially moved from inconvenient to dangerous. I ended up at the instance of Transparency International leaving my husband and children in Nigeria to head to Berlin, Germany, to continue my work of advocating for good governance and the restoration of democracy in my country. It was here in the UK that I then had interactions with our TI United Kingdom for many months before heading out to Germany again. Fortuitously, because as the Almighty would have it, 1998 saw the end of the draconian militarization that was the ruination of our country. By then, I was in the United States. And I was registered in the program Leaders for Development at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. And my teacher, one of my teachers, was Baroness Shelley Williams. At that time, I said to Shelley, who took very affectionate bonding with me, that my next move was to start a PhD program at the King's College London on international law and diplomacy. And Shelley looked at me and said, it's public policy. It's not international law that your country needs. It's public policy, not international law that Africa needs. And she said to me, apply to Harvard University and start a training in public policy. You would be of better use to your country and the continent with such training. That marked the change of my professional life. The reason that I had wanted to do a PhD in international law was because I already had a master's in international law. And my desire was to be an international diplomat, even though I had trained as a chartered accountant. But when Shelley mentored me, I changed my course of occupation. Ladies and gentlemen, I was at the Kennedy School, and as I trained in public policy, I fell into the hands of yet another great person who mentored me, Professor Jeffrey Sachs. He was taken in by what he called my contagious, infectious passion about my country. That even when my country was a basket case, I'd keep saying that my country is going to be one of the greatest countries in the world. 
<laughs> and Professor Sachs would say to me, Obi, get real. <laughs> Your country is in crisis and in trouble. And I would say, you don't know what I am talking about. I know that we're going to be great. And so when the door of democracy opened up in 1999, I had my own laugh at Jeffrey. I said, you thought it was never going to happen. Now it has happened. And Jeffrey became not just my teacher, but my supervisor because he hired me to work for him. And as we worked, we began to focus on a debt sustainability analysis for Nigeria, because we could see clearly that Nigeria's debt situation made the democracy very threatened. And by focusing on the debt sustainability work, we engaged with the Clinton White House making a case for Nigeria's debt to be canceled. Jeffrey Sachs, as you know, had been very much a champion of the debt reduction that happened in some of the transition economies of Eastern Europe at a point in time, especially his work with Poland. He brought that experience to bear, and I was named by him as the director of the Nigeria Harvard Economic Strategy Program. The work on the debt sustainability and the advocacy with the administration at that time earned us some support for the idea that we were pushing. But not everybody was excited at the prospect of debt reduction for Nigeria. Congress and Treasury were not persuaded. Even with very uncheering data that showed that eight times what Nigeria was spending on health was being spent on debt servicing, and seven times what Nigeria was spending on health was being spent on debt servicing, and that the oil per capita for Nigeria was less than $100 per Nigerian person. And so that advocacy came to a dead end because the administration people said, giving debt reduction to Nigeria would amount to moral hazard. You have behaved badly, in Nigeria. Here's a check so you can behave worse. And they thought that the taxpayer's money of America was not going to go into such a thing. It was at this point that a certain Ted Turner of CNN and the one who started to finance the UN Foundation took a very critical interest in the work that the Center for International Development at Harvard was doing to support a number of the fragile countries on the continent. And as part of that process, we designed the program to enable me go back to Nigeria <coughs> for an 18-month period to generate some reform that would improve the spending pattern in Nigeria so that we could have data to prove that Nigeria had changed its ways in the use of its scarce resources. If we could have such evidence, we could reopen the conversation on debt reduction for Nigeria. And so, Ladies and gentlemen, I went home for an 18-month assignment. I ended up being in Nigeria for six and a half years and became a part of the administration of President Olusegun Obasanjo. But I haven't been as successful 
as my colleagues in talking about the work that I did while I was in government. But without going into too much self-aggrandizing details, it was exciting work that one did. In government, I was a technocrat, a policy wonk, who's, who actually got work done. From designing and implementing the public procurement reform that saved the country billions of dollars to creating more transparency in the Nigerian extractive industries and in the management of its scarce mineral resources as Minister of Solid Minerals, we worked hard to build a new Nigeria. However, the single biggest challenge in doing the work that included my stint as Minister of Education was dealing with our country's political class. They were not supportive. <laughs> they were not responsible. They were not interested in helping the poor and the weak most of the times. There were very important, significant ones amongst them that cared for development. But in the majority, the attitude towards government was that government was a means of livelihood to the individual political class member. They were interested in enriching themselves through government contracts and the rest of government coffers. Many times while I was working on due process and public procurement reforms, they would summon me to the National Assembly because some of the colleagues on the executive arm of government would say to them, make sure you bring her before you and frustrate her so that they would see that the due process is delaying development. That way, they can stop that bottleneck that is standing in the way of development for the Nigerian people, when as a matter of fact, what they really meant was that the due process was standing in the way of the pocket that used to depend on public contracts. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the famous anecdotes from my time in reforming the public procurement system was to have been accosted by a member of the National Assembly who said to me, you are the woman who has made Abuja very dry. And when he said that, I looked at him and said, get ready because it will get drier. <laughs> that didn't end me friendship at all. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, despite all the challenges, I left a legacy in my time in government, which you can read on my campaign website. It's ob2019.com. You can find a number of the things that we did there. I thought perhaps this was just a trouble with Nigeria. And so, persuaded by Paul, Wolfowitz, who was at that time the president of the World Bank. I joined the World Bank as vice president of Africa region, where I spent several years working closely with governments across Africa to transform what the economist had sadly described as the dark continent to a rising continent. Although, again, although we succeeded with the biggest challenges that the, a number of the countries faced, one thing was clear. The political economy context within which reforms had to be delivered on was very troubled. It was then that I realized the depth of our problem as a continent. I often joke that if you took a politician or the political class from Nigeria and moved them to Kenya and moved the Kenyans to Nigeria, the citizens won't notice the difference. <laughs> By the time I returned to Nigeria, much of the work we had done while I was in government, I returned to Nigeria from the World Bank in 2012. Much of the work that we had done while I was in government 
had been undone by a new set of political class who did not care at all on the impact of that unraveling on the poor people of the country. I remember that so much of the progress that we had made was reversed because the political class ignored, ignored the work of governance and focused on their brand of politics, which was about governance as a series of transactions. In fact, one of the successes that followed my time in the Ministry of Education was asked what his vision for his time in education would be. And he responded to the journalists to reform Ezekwesili's reforms. <laughs> the result of this recklessness are what we now see in the human indicators, especially in Nigeria. Nigeria is now the global capital of extreme poverty, with over with 87 million of our people living in extreme poverty, overtaking India, which is seven times our population, with just 79 million of their 1.3 billion citizens in the same circumstance. Nigeria is growing at a very low rate that does not come close to our population growth rate. Nigeria is number 15 most fragile country in the fragility index, global fra fragility index. Nigeria is set to become the world's capital of infant mortality. Nigeria is the global leader in the number of school children that are out of school at 13.2 million. Nigeria has a literacy level of 57 compared to even war-torn countries that came back with the right kind of focus on education. We can go on and on about the impact of our political class on our development outcomes. The irony of this is that we know how to build inclusive government and social justice because we have seen some of the ideas on economic growth that translates to improvement in the quality of the human life in many other countries that started off on the development process at the same time as our country. By investing in human capital, India raised roughly 300 million people out of poverty in 13 years. Today, Indian doctors, IT experts, and scientists dot the world over. It has helped India to increase remittances that are sent home by nationals who are spread across the world. China's investment in health and education has been a great example. In 1990, 66% of the Chinese population were in poverty. And in 15 years, it lifted almost 500 million of them out of poverty. By today's calculation, China's great progress in lifting 700 million Chinese out of poverty within a total of less than four decades is something that is not short of an economic revolution. Since then, problems have been solved. 
by different countries. I do recall that even in the case of China, one in three of every Chinese child was malnourished in 1990. This impacted on their physical and mental health. But today, a lot of that problem has been solved. All students graduate from secondary school and almost half attend university in major institutions around the world. As a country of roughly 180 million people, Nigeria is in real danger of falling into troubles that our contemporaries started solving many years ago. And if we are not careful, we could slide even further behind in the next four years ahead of us. And that is why I have decided that the embarrassment of watching our country go further down the development milestone compared to contemporary countries that started the development process at the same time must end. My time in government appeared to offer a sense that we could do governance work and make progress. My time outside of government has shown to us that ultimately politics trumps policy. And that if politics trumps policy, it would not matter how many more technocrats we send into government. What would make the difference would be the technocrats that we can convert to politicians. I am today running as a candidate in the 2019 elections because I choose to be a forerunner of those who would enter into Nigerian politics and politics in countries across the continent to change the anomaly of what Plato spoke to when he said that those who consider politics to be beneath them shall be ruled by their inferior. The story of our continent has been the story of the worst amongst us governing the best amongst us in our politics. And it is time for a radical departure from this unacceptable state of affairs. That is why when I watched the politicians ignore the victims in that latest report on Nigeria becoming the world capital of extreme poverty, but rather focused on blame games and who had done it and who had not done it without even any kind of embarrassment and sense of commitment to those who have become victims of bad governance, I decided that it was time to enter into the turf of the politicians and that technological disruption can also be adopted to ensure political disruption. And so the concept of the disruption of politics is what guides my move into this next phase of my life. It will be a focus on lifting 80 million Nigerians out of poverty. It would be a focus on making economic freedom the center of economic policy conversation. Because our political class has always used the 
dominance of government over the economy as a basis to perpetuate the poor governance that we have seen. Economic freedom and an economic philosophy that puts a premium on market as a disciplinarian of the choices of citizens and the marketplace would be a part of the process of reverting Nigerian and Africa politics. Also the courage to stand up against vested interests. The focus of our time in government, of my time as an elected president, would be to change the maxim of our development agenda. It would become oil relegated for the impact that it has had on the political incentives and disincentives that held Nigeria bound. And so the key point of the new generation that we shall birth in the course of my time in politics will be a nation where education is the new oil and human capital is the new economy. Everything about the choice that we make will move the Nigerian Human Development Index, which today is number 152 out of 157 out of the region of embarrassment and lack of productivity of the Nigerian citizen and country. Productivity and competitiveness will be the anchor upon which our economic reforms will be implemented. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Obi, for that inspirational speech. And I'm sure we have many people who are going to want to ask you questions. Um, for those that do, could I ask you please to give your name and affiliation and wait until the microphone is handed to you from the lady at the back. Um, please, can I have the first questions? Um, as there are quite a lot, shall we take three questions at a time? So one, two, three. Um. Welcome, Minister Tony Carroll. Um, I'm a professor at Johns Hopkins University in Washington and uh, known you since your days as Minister of Solid Minerals. Um, we're all a little perplexed about the failure of Nigeria to embrace the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. Uh, Nigeria could do a lot more in its, its building its industrial base and trading with its neighbors. Wondering if you had any thoughts on that. My name is Bisi Alimi, and um, I'm a Nigerian living here in the UK. And um, I'm, I'm going to start with your very last um, comment, and that is about the undertone of capitalism. And for me, it's a little bit shocking that, it, considering what the topic is, there are no social structure on how to get Nigerians out of poverty. Your focus is on, you know, market-driven uh, approach, which I think, considering what is going on in the world, is not still the best solution to the problem. But my main question is, and I would just like to stand up. Briefly. Please. Yeah, very briefly. Um, considering this topic of social justice and inclusion, does LGBT people include the Nigeria that you're looking for? Because in 2009, while you were still the vice president of the World Bank, you refused to attend and even stop an attempt to rescue gay men who were caught up in a World Bank project in Tanzania because your faith is against it. When the SSNPA was signed in Nigeria in 2014, you and I had a spat on, uh, on Twitter, which led to you blocking me. When you uh, said, we, sorry, we, please, no, it's a question, it's briefly, about inclusion please. and social justice. Uh, I yes, think that question have, should be asked. We only have I just want to ask minutes. if anything has changed considering the fact that we're talking about inclusion and social justice. 
Does that in your program include people like me who were driven out of the country to be a refugee in this country? Will you consider me in your social justice in your Nigeria of 2019? Hello, good afternoon. My name is Aladi Paul Kusaka, I'm a member of the general public. Um, just wanted to ask your opinion on the government's current social investment programs, like you know, the school feeding program, um, Empower, and, and all. Um, what would you do? Would you continue them, or would you move towards a more market-friendly approach to um, um, remove poverty? Okay. Um, let me do this. I do better when I stand. We do have <laughs> to finish at half past. Sure. Um, so um, the free trade, <laughs> Nigeria and South Africa's anchor uh, states in Africa should lead, really be leading the charge on integrating Africa as quickly as possible because Africa's current internal trade at less than 15% pales in comparison to what you have in um, Latin America at 40-45% in uh, North America at more than 50%, in uh, Europe at more than 70%, in Asia at more than 55 to 60%. So what it means is that there is so much capacity for Africa to increase its GDP um, from just less than uh, $3 trillion to much more than that through trade. And the two countries clearly do not see the benefit of acting as, as, as progressively as possible to en enable that. Data shows that for every 1% of growth in Nigeria or South Africa, the rest of the continent grows by at least half a percent. That is significant growth that we lose when they don't. So I am a champion for the economic integration of the continent. In my work at the World Bank, it was a major program of integration. So trade is major for us. And if Africa cannot trade with the rest of the world, Africa can trade with Africa. Um, on the tone of capitalism, um, uh, BC, I think that what is very clear to us is that capitalism has its limits. And I am not uh, one of those uh, starry-eyed people on capitalism in its puritanical state. But I am one of those pragmatic enough to know that as often as the market can solve the problems, we must use the market to solve the problems. However, because we recognize that capitalism lives in its wake, very strong possibilities of inequality, we need to arrange the solutions in the kind of way that it is as inclusive as possible. And inclusive growth has become a way to achieve that. Part of the reason that my emphasis is on human development is that we know that human development captures skills, knowledge, productivity, resilience, the capacity to be adaptive, and that the more that people are given these tools of engagement, the better they are in generating the possibilities that are available to them. So I would argue that even for our own country and the countries in the rest of the continent where the political class has acted not in the common interest of the poor, that the more the market can solve the problem and discipline the choices that we make, the better for us because it reduces the opportunities for corruption. And the systemic corruption that we've seen in many of the economies has been exactly because of the confusion between the role of the nation state and the role of the market. And so economic pragmatism of how the market works and how the government can be very strong in policy making, in institutions building, and investing in the critical infrastructure and world-class human capital that is required to generate broad shared growth and deal with the challenges of inequality would be my way to go. I will massively de deregulate the Nigerian economy. Sources of growth have to expand to rapidly provide opportunities for those who are currently excluded from the benefits of economic growth. 
Um, on, um, and then, of course, uh, I, I, I would just take quickly the social investment program. So the social investment program, especially when it is designed to be productive, productive social safety nets do better. You don't want to entrap people into conditions of depending on handouts perpetually. Part of what must happen is that the weakest and the most vulnerable in our midst must be given the opportunity to operate at the level that they can operate. The more that it is market-based solutions for us, even for the people at the bottom of the pyramid, the better that we see that outcomes are favorable to address inequalities. But the social investment program is one thing that I believe in because we would have those who are unable to participate in the level of competitiveness that we would like to drive of the Nigerian economy. Um, the um, BC uh, spoke about uh, the LGBT. I absolutely believe in the fact that everyone is entitled to equal opportunity. So in the, uh, the realm of public policy, I wouldn't, it wouldn't matter to me what your belief is, what you choose to uh, believe in, what, how you choose to. It's, it's basically the fact that equality of opportunity will define my time in government. I believe that equality of opportunity offers everyone the right to live. It offers everyone the right to aspire. That would definitely be the way that I run the government that I shall lead. On your specific mention of Tanzania, when I was um, the vice president at the World Bank, one specific measure that we took was to make sure that governments understand the concept of equality to the human life. And so I don't know where you got the particular impression that we, I would, that I didn't do anything. I reached out to the Tanzanian government on that matter, on the premise that equality of opportunity is an entitlement to every member of every society. Thank you so very much. Um, very, very brief questions. Um, the gentleman in the front and behind, I mean, th three very brief questions. Sorry, it should have been. It's behind you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is David Chidji. I'm a member of the House of Lords and the co-chair of the All-Party Africa Group. Congratulations on your presentation, Dr. Obi, if I may. A quick question. Uh, there's a lot of concern at the moment of the uh, over internal stability within Nigeria, uh, particularly the conflicts between the herders and the farmers. And my question to you is, do you believe that this is an economic dis dispute or is there a deeper and cultural and religious conflict, um, maybe stoked up by the work of uh, Boko Haram? And what do you see as the way forward to resolving this? I think we should take the answer to that first, actually, as I'm wary of the time. Okay. I should take that? Yes. Please. Okay. So um, there are different shapes and mutation of conflict that we have seen in the country in recent. It, it's mutated. Uh, in, in many ways. Um, and the headers, um, farmers crisis that we have had to deal with is um, perhaps an exemplification of um, a mix of drivers that lead to conflict and then lead to criminality because it goes beyond crisis now. It is plenty of criminality. And one of the aspects of it is the failure of the nation state to act effectively to tackle issues of insecurity. One of the factors that drive this is the conversation around land ownership and the kind of reforms that are necessary to balance out the contradictory needs of different participants in the economic space of our country. The headers have an economic need of land. The farmers have an economic need of land. The disappearing effective nation state makes it difficult to negotiate what could be easy solutions 
in the realm of public policy to addressing an equitable use of natural resources that both categories of economic participants require. And so for me as president, I would lead the conversation that not only looks at the resources management, but also in terms of the effect and impact of climate change on the country and the neighboring, um, the, the neighbors of our country, because the entire route through which the needs of the headsmen are met goes beyond the boundary of Nigeria. So a regional solution is an important part of that conversation. The second thing that I would do is that I would be a very effective commander in chief of the armed forces. I will not, I will not allow any group of people to think that they have comfort and they have opportunity to strike against the Nigerian territory, operating from within our territory and feeling comfortable within our territory to behave badly. There will be consequences for every Nigerian life that is in any way destroyed or maimed. I think the nation state would wake up under my presidency. Enough of the failure to make the human life the primacy and the basis of our existence as a nation. I believe that my emphasis on human development, my emphasis on human development captures them, Caroline. It captures the entirety of what connects economy to security and connects security to the social capital and the social construct of our society. For me, ensuring that we would immediately improve the economic livelihood of Nigerian people is part of the human security agenda. Ensuring that we would embark on proactive, preemptive, and preventive strategy for a security sector is going to be very important. And ensuring that a security sector reform is not so drawn out that we continue to reward incompetency and unprofessionalism within a security establishment would be a complementary part of the work that we shall do. So for me, if education would be the new oil and human capital would be the new economy, I must keep.